Tornadoes are annual, even monthly occurrences for residents of America's Tornado Alley, a swath of the southern Great Plains and Midwestern states characterized largely by their location in the center of a landmass. Whether fronts collide here above the spring and summer sun-baked earth, spawning tornadoes as terrifying in their destructive power as they are unpredictable in the path they'll take throughout the country. Today's residents are well familiar with the sound of the formerly named civil defense sirens put into use during World War II in case of attacks on American soil. Since 1970, nationwide, these sirens sound to alert the presence or imminent formation of a tornado in the area, warning residents in the projected path of the storm to take immediate shelter until the danger has passed. Woodward, Oklahoma, as well as many other parts of Tornado Alley, would have undoubtedly benefited from this warning system on April 9th, 1947. A storm system began to form in the Texas Panhandle, and before the destruction had wound down, at least six tornadoes would form and each travel at least part of a 220-mile distance between Amarillo, Texas, and Wichita, Kansas. At 8.42 p.m. local time, what is now classified as an F5 tornado, the largest and most destructive grade of storm, swept through Woodward estimated to have been a staggering 1.8 miles wide it traveled over 100 miles in total completely destroying 100 city blocks in woodward alone before losing strength outside the eastern part of the county it would prove to be the deadliest tornado to date in oklahoma's history killing 116 and wounding over a thousand people the destruction would spur authorities to create and implement a warning system to benefit the citizens in the future. Unfortunately for the Croft family of Woodward, the aftermath of the tornado would be remembered a little differently. The Croft household was directly in the path of the storm. Father Olin Croft and daughters Geraldine, seven, and Joan Gay, four, were injured by the damage. Olin was trapped underneath debris and took longer to remove from the rubble, while both girls, though injured, were transported to the local hospital by a neighbor who was able to help. The girl's mother, Clayta Croft, succumbed to her injuries while still trapped in the ruins of the family home. The hospital was a buzzing hub of activity and panic. The girl's injuries were assessed, though little Joan had what was described as a 10-inch splinter, perhaps as thick as a broomstick through her right calf, neither girl needed immediate life-saving care. They were made as comfortable as possible on cots in the hospital basement, which was pressed into service as an overflow waiting area for patients to be either treated or transported to Oklahoma City's hospital. What transpired sometime in the next two hours is any parent's worst nightmare. From what few witness statements there were, two men entered the hospital wearing work uniform clothing with what was described as a type of company logo on the shirt. They asked a nurse where the Croft girls were. Upon locating them in the basement, one picked up little Joan and they walked out of the hospital with her, telling the nurse that questioned them that they were taking her, quote, out of this mess to Washington for care, a small town 60 miles away. Perhaps because the small Woodward Hospital was overwhelmed, or perhaps because they bluffed their way through the situation, the two men left with little Joan Croft, and she has never 
been seen since. In all the confusion of the hospital that night, only three people could definitively say they had seen Joan with her sister Geraldine in the basement area. The neighbor who brought them to the hospital, another neighbor who came through looking for her own family, and the nurse who made the girls comfortable specifically remembered giving Joan a drink of water. Geraldine was understandably confused and upset and was unable to give more than a passing description of the men who took her sister. Joan, for her part, did protest that she wanted to stay with her sister, though her father would later describe her in newspaper interviews as a bashful child around strangers. Olin's injuries were more substantial, and he had been transported to Oklahoma City. He would not know Joan was missing for two days. Geraldine was transported to Oklahoma City for treatment of her injuries and would not be able to speak to her father for almost a week. Clayda's family began looking for little Joan the day after the storm with no luck. The Red Cross and the Oklahoma Highway Patrol had been notified and were doing all they could to find her. To make the situation even worse, the FBI was unable to assist because they would not have jurisdiction unless there was positive proof of kidnapping. Newspapers across the nation carried the story of the storm and the missing girl. In the following two months, the search would widen out to include neighboring states, New Mexico, Colorado, Kansas, and Texas Highway Patrols were notified of Jones' disappearance. Complicating any search at the time was the nature of transportation. According to maps of the time, only one major paved thoroughfare was constructed through Woodward. Other state roads may not have been paved. Three railroad lines branched out from the town as well, northeast to Missouri, northwest to Kansas, and southwest to Texas. Reports of children who could be Joan came from both Kansas and Texas, but came to nothing. City officials began to fear she had died of her wounds and was buried with an incorrect grave marker. Remarkably, only three unidentified persons were buried after the storm, an adult, an eight-year-old, and a two-year-old. Clayda's sister Ruth viewed at least one deceased girl who was close in age and coloring to Joan, but was sure the children were not her niece. Time stretched on. Reports of possible sightings came in less and less frequently. Olin took Geraldine and moved out of town, needing to move forward with life somehow, certain that wherever Joan was, she wasn't in Woodward. Newspapers in the region ran retrospective articles on the tornado's anniversary, revisiting Joan's disappearance in the hope of drumming up new leads or at least keeping the lost little girl in the public consciousness. In recent years, DNA testing has ruled out some women who suspect that they may be Joan, partially due to the fact that they have similar scars that her storm injuries could have produced. Ruth's daughter has submitted DNA into the CODIS system, as have two of Joan and Geraldine's half-siblings, in hope that one day, familial DNA may give them answers. Joan will turn 81 this October 28th. Perhaps she's still with us. Maybe there's still time. Who were the men who came to the hospital in the storm's wake looking for one little girl? by name. Why did they take her? Where did they take her? Did she receive any medical treatment for her injuries? Did she grow up far from Oklahoma with a new name and a new family and perhaps a nagging suspicion in a dark corner of her mind that there was something she can't quite remember? One thing is for certain, no one will blame you for checking on your children just once more. Thank you for watching. Remember, you may not believe it, but anything is possible in a world so seriously strange. If you're into dark, mysterious content, you might really enjoy my series, Greylock. The channel is linked in the description below. But I also have plenty more content here for you that will have you on the edge of your seat or up making sure all your doors and windows are locked. So be sure to subscribe to my channel now, because you won't want to miss what's next. And I'll see you next time.
Welcome back to normal for residents of Berkshire County. 